Mars is the ambitious destination for SpaceX and Elon Musk in 2030, but you probably know that reaching the red planet, which is an average of about 140 million miles from Earth, would be a colossal feat. This led to a nearly two-year-long journey that was a nightmare for astronauts who have to navigate numerous risks in deep space. The only solution is to increase the speed of the spacecraft. This is where nuclear systems come into play. So to realize his ambitions, how will Elon Musk incorporate nuclear energy into Starship? Why is this inherently hazardous nuclear energy garnering attention for space exploration activities? Let's find out in today's episode of Alpha Tech. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun, and the second closest to Earth, but it's definitely farther than you can imagine. In theory, the closest that Earth and Mars would approach each, and Earth is at its farthest. This would put the planets only 54.6 million kilometers apart. Sadly, this has never happened in recorded history. The two planets are farthest apart when they are both farthest from the Sun, on opposite sides of the star. At this point, they can be 401 million kilometers apart. In general, the average distance between Earth and Mars is 225 million kilometers, and it would take you around nine months to reach the red planet. What's really scary is the more time you spend in transit, the higher the chance of something going wrong. Space may look like a vast and empty void, but the Cosmos team with invisible, high-energy radiation particles traveling near light speed that can pummel human travelers and the surfaces of the world like tiny bullets. The whole Mars journey would expose astronauts to about a thousand millisieverts. This means the first Martian explorers could get roughly eight times the amount of radiation per year of radiation workers' annual exposure limit. In total, Space travelers would get about one-third of the way toward hitting a NASA's astronaut maximum lifetime exposure limit. The only way to reduce radiation exposure is to get where you are going quicker. So to get to the scale intended by Elon, faster transportation is the necessity. Musk has indicated in the past that he's considering different options for powering spacecraft. For instance, he has tweeted about how nuclear-powered rockets would be a great area of research for NASA. There's a reason for this. So far, the most common propulsion systems in use are chemical propulsion and solar-powered electric propulsion systems. Let's see. Chemical propulsion systems provide lots of thrust. But chemical rockets aren't particularly efficient, and rocket fuel isn't that energy dense. The Saturn V rocket that took astronauts to the moon produced 35 million newtons of force at liftoff and carried 950,000 gallons of fuel. While most of the fuel was used in getting the rocket to orbit, the limitations are apparent. It takes a lot of heavy fuel to get anywhere. Electric propulsion systems generate thrust using electricity produced from solar panels. These devices can have more than five times higher mass efficiency than chemical systems. But they produce much less thrust, about three newtons. The energy source, the sun, is essentially infinite, but becomes less useful the farther away from the sun the ship gets. One of the reasons nuclear-powered rockets are promising is because they offer incredible energy density. The uranium fuel used in nuclear reactors has an energy density that's 4 million times higher than hydrazine, a typical chemical rocket propellant. It's much easier to get a small amount of uranium to space than hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel. This means that instead of taking a minimum of 9 months to reach stars, the starship with nuclear energy could potentially reduce the travel time to just 52 days. So, how could the design of Starship be adjusted to utilize this energy? Starship will still be a 50-meter-tall steel tube that launches atop the super-heavy booster, using vacuum-optimized engines fed by large propellant tanks and a set of smaller gimbaled engines optimized for landing with flaps to handle re-entry. It might be surprising to you that we cannot simply bolt on nuclear rockets to the Starship and expect everything to work. Special modifications have to be made to accommodate the new propulsion system, ranging from new attachment points to control software. But we will focus on the most impactful one, radiation shielding. The shape of the Starship is not well adapted to handling the radiation from a nuclear rocket. Large flaps are extending to the sides that could scatter radiation back into the crew compartment at the top. Retracting them when the nuclear rockets are in use would be a good idea. Designs that were meant to be nuclear from the start also usually place the reactor or nuclear rocket far from the main body of the spaceship, on the end of a long boom or taper propellant tanks. Radiation released from a fission reaction spreads as a sphere in all directions. If it's placed further away, the main body of the spaceship intercepts a smaller fraction of it. The fraction of radiation that cannot be avoided is handled using radiation shielding. 
with different layers is meant to absorb different types of radiation. It is placed as close as possible to the reactors or engines to create the widest shadow of protection, which is why they are also called shadow shields. But it also needs to aim to minimize the required shielding mass. Fission primarily produces fission fragments, gamma rays, and neutrons. Fission fragments, being heavy ions, don't travel far. Gamma rays, however, are best absorbed by dense materials, with tungsten being an ideal choice due to its density. Neutrons, which have no charge, are effectively blocked by hydrogen-rich materials like water. To officially protect against neutrons, lithium hydride, LIH, is the preferred material. Being mass-efficient, boron carbide, B4C, is also effective, but is heavier and suitable for surfaces exposed to re-entry heating. Some radiation protection measures have already been integrated. Built-in protection includes a beryllium or graphite reflector within the nuclear reactor, preventing some radiation from escaping. The landing propellant of Starship, especially its methane, also absorbs neutrons. A substantial load of propellant will act as shielding, and the separation between engines and the crew compartment minimizes radiation interception. It's important to note that the effectiveness of radiation shielding doesn't increase linearly, but rather improves exponentially with thickness. This means it's relatively easy to adjust and fine-tune the protection levels as needed. Finally, to adapt the spacecraft for nuclear rocket engines, there are key changes in propellant supply. The volume currently used by liquid oxygen would be extended for the nuclear engines, maintaining the total propellant tank volume for a fair comparison with other Starship versions. If liquid hydrogen is chosen as the propellant, specially designed tanks with insulation and active cooling would be necessary. However, with Starship using liquid methane to fuel the nuclear rockets, the existing propellant tanks can be retained. Additionally, adjustments would be needed for the landing propellant tanks. The expected heavier dry mass of a nuclear-powered Starship would require larger tanks to accommodate the increased propellant needed for landing. Now, there's an important question that you're wondering. Is a nuclear-powered Starship safe? Honestly, many people's idea of anything nuclear is a disaster waiting to happen or harmful radiation that could make people die. Let's look at the safety of the riders in the Starship first. The risk of radiation would be mitigated through the rocket's design of liquid propellants. The Starship will still carry propellant for backup stored between the engine and the crew area blocking out radioactive particles and acting as a good radiation shield. Apart from that, the distance between the crew and the reactor also provides a buffer as the design would place the living quarters at the other end of the rocket to the reactor. So what about the safety of people outside the Starship? Musk's already thought of that in another tweet. He said that the nuclear reactor on board the spacecraft will only kick in when it's cleared the Earth's orbit. This shows Musk is proceeding with lots of caution. This also means the Starship will still be launched by the Super Heavy, powered by chemical propellants, but the nuclear reactor will fire up after the two stages separate. Once in orbit, the nuclear reactor can do little harm as blasts and thermal radiation cannot move through a vacuum. If disaster struck and the rocket's reactor broke up to pieces, it wouldn't even land on Earth or any other planet for tens of thousands of years. By that time, the radioactive substance would have naturally decayed to the point where it wasn't hazardous anymore. So a nuclear-powered starship is safe for everybody. That's all for today's episode. Hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Please let us know what you think in the comments section below. Your feedback is very important to us and helps us make better videos for you. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.